My lovely, lovely imps, those of you who are watching in the future and those of you who are here with me live, we are about to react to the one, the only, the amazing atheist, aka TJ Kirk. Uh, we are going to be reacting to a, a recently published video by TJ Kirk, which is called, oh, I got to change this text here. Don't mind that. TJ Kirk, the amazing atheist. There we go. Uh, we are going to be reacting to how I created the S anti SJW genre and almost destroyed the world. I am extremely, extremely excited to watch this video. As you all know, I have a very good relationship with TJ Kirk. Uh, we have talked a lot off stream. We have talked multiple times for extended hours on stream. I'm, I, uh, I am quite a, a, a fan of, of TJ Kirk these days, and we've had a lot of very nice conversations. Um, TJ Kirk has talked about his past on YouTube a couple times, but I have been told this video is a particularly good uh, uh, memoir, maybe? I don't know, on what happened there. Um, didn't I talk to him with his awesome face paint? Yes, I did. TJ Kirk does awesome face paint. He does, uh, like, Swamp Shaman, Bayou Shaman. Uh, vibes and it is so cool um and anyway we're gonna react to this today uh because it's really interesting to me i have not seen it i this is a fresh react uh most of my reacts are fresh uh though once in a great while i will watch something with my chat i'll always tell you if it is this is a fresh react um yeah, so we're going to react to this and we're going to find out what TJ Kirk has to say. I've, I've been told by multiple people that this is a great video, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited. Yeah. As far as I know, TJ Kirk literally did start the anti-SJW movement, albeit unintentionally. Yeah, um, he did. Uh, yeah, so. I think he's from Louisiana. Yes, I believe he is from Louisiana, um, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, let's watch this, shall we? Let's do it. Let's watch this together. I'm very excited to watch this, and I'm probably going to have a lot of thoughts about it. But uh, without any further ado, let's go. So I saw this thing on Vosh's uh, subreddit. It is TJ Kirk, and then in parentheses, the amazing atheist, partially responsible for the anti-SJW culture. I voted yes. Uh, I don't think that I'm uh, partially responsible for anti-SJW culture. I think I'm largely responsible for it at least as it impressive impressive that he would own that up like i said a strong start to the video it as far as i know the amazing atheist really was the first anti-sjw youtuber He has always been honest. Yes, it's something I've always respected about TJ Kirk is that TJ Kirk is, has always struck me as an incredibly honest person and also very real, even when it's unpopular to be so. Um, even if he even if he later like re reconsiders his positions, he always owns his positions. And I very much like that. I respect that a lot. I don't know if he was doing it before Thunderfoot. Well, Thunderfoot's videos were very different, though. Thunderfoot's videos were like uh, were like more traditional debunks, whereas um, T.J. Kirk's early videos were like this very um, they were very entertaining, uh, like takedowns. More it was more like it. Whereas um, Thunderfoot's videos were more like, oh, you got this fact wrong. Owned anti-science person. Owned creationist. Let's see. Let's continue. It takes shape on YouTube. I think if you were tracing back the genealogical origins of anti-SJW uh, content on YouTube, the... Also, just a side note. First of all, TJ Kirk's uh, backdrop is so sick. It's so clean. And he also looks great here. These The glasses with the cut is a really good look on him. I miss his face paint. I really love his fucking face paint. But I always got to say, his his setup looks so slick. It's great. The genesis of it would likely be a video that I made several years ago called It's Only Sexist When Men Do It. I don't think that you can find a better catalyst in YouTube history for there being this jumping off point of now there's all this anti-SGW content coming out, you know? I didn't coin the term. I remember that video from back in the day. 
that video went so viral. It's like, it's like, it's wild. It's like, it was, it was so viral. It went so fucking viral. Term anti-SJW or SJW for that matter. But I think I invented the genre. And as the inventor of the genre, I have to say, I despise the genre at this point. I almost view <laughs> what I did in terms of being maybe like a first wave anti-SJW content and what exists now as being like a bastard offspring second or third wave of that content. I think that the criticisms that I was levying at the time were way more cogent, but also I never viewed SJW stuff online, stuff that maybe would by today's standards be called uh, woke scold content by uh, Vosh's audience and some other audiences out there in the uh, YouTube space. I'm a little guilty. A little guilty. I don't like the woke scolds. But what can I say? The woke scolds suck. Um, I never viewed that content as being particularly important. I never tried to lay out the case that it was the... Uh, it was leading to the collapse of Western civilization or that we, we're in a culture war for our lives. I never spun that sort of narrative. For me, SJW content uh, on YouTube or out there in the mainstream or wherever you might find it was nothing more than something ludicrous to be mocked. And I enjoyed mocking it. And even to this day, I will hear stuff that... <laughs> you know, makes me roll my eyes uh, and that I would, you know, back in the day I would have jumped on. So uh, just the other day, I was uh, told about a story that um, there were some people upset at Tim Burton's uh, new Wednesday show on Netflix because there were black bullies in the show. And that just struck me as totally absurd because it's like, yeah, there's black bullies in real life. You know, just because racism exists, just because there have been problems in this country with systemic racism, and, you know, obviously you couldn't go into the whole history of the U.S. with slavery and, um, you know, uh, redlining and, and police uh, discrimination and, and so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean there's never been a black bully. And that doesn't mean that we have to go over every socio-political ramification of depicting a black bully in a, in a TV show. Um, Real quick, uh, from chat, uh, 2010 to 2015 leftist content was incredibly cringe, unfortunately. I have horrible news to tell you. Twenty In 2010 to 2015, there was so little actual leftist content, it was almost all liberal content and almost nothing more. There were so few leftists actually making content. Like, let's see, there was Zexeasy, I believe Zexeasy was still making content around then. Sam Cedar was making content around then. Matt, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael Brooks. Cat uh, Black. Oh, Cat Black. Cat Black. Credit goes to Cat Black. Cat Black has been around for a long time doing this stuff. But that's basically it. Sam Cedar's a lib, but he's a lib that platforms a lot of lefties. Um, Sam Cedar has like a, a very social Democrat um, type approach to things or, or yeah, social Democrat. But, um, but yeah, it was all lib content. That was all that there was on the internet. Even the feminist stuff was super lib-minded. It was all about representation and nothing else. That's it. We need more women CEOs. We need more women dro drone pilots. That's it. That's all you would get from 2010 to 2015. One of the greatest things, one of the few things that we have now, thanks to people like myself. Press the like button, you know, press the like button. Thank goodness, thank God, thank, thank fucking hell that I'm here, right? You know, anyway, uh, not to toot my horn for so long, but now you have actual lefty content. You have lefties who are seriously challenging the ideas that are behind capitalism. You have people who are seriously challenging questions of identity. You have people who are seriously pushing back on uh, 
you know, and I'm I'm the I'm the tiniest. I was joking about how I'm here, but I am. The fact that I'm here at all proves how much has changed. I'm serious. It was it was it was dire straits. I didn't know the ills of capitalism until I watched a ContraPoints video in 2020. In 2020! 2010 to 2015 was dreadful! It was like BuzzFeed manspreading articles and nothing else. You would never get an analysis of class. You would never get an analysis, a, a serious analysis of, uh, of, of, uh, of racism. You would never get a serious analysis of patriarchy. It was all, we need more women in video games and we need more, less manspreading. It was pathetic. The state of affairs was bad. It was super recuperated. Let's continue. I think that, you know, donning the level of sensitivity where you can't even see something like that in media without, be, you know, grasping your pearls and taking such profound offense as if this is the, the, the problem that's going on, or is this is even part of a problem, I think is uh, is stu stupid and silly. And, you know, back in my anti-SJW days, I would have jumped on that as content. But the problem is that I never really understood that there were... Uh, Striped Kidder says, I wholeheartedly believe BuzzFeed feminism did near irreparable damage to feminism. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed feminism is is what we call fully, wholly recuperated feminism. Now, I'm not saying that every person that wrote for BuzzFeed at the time was bad or that BuzzFeed never put out a good article. But the article, but the way that BuzzFeed was run was clickbait. It meant that feminist issues were being used uh, not to actually provoke thought, not to actually promote the idea, but to generate controversy. Obviously, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed loved the controversy. It made them money. It was good for them to hire somebody to write the dumbest article you've ever heard about manspreading because it made them money. Nefarious characters, nefarious actors within the sort of genre that I created that were trying to subvert it for extremist political uh, positioning. And it really wasn't in, until we were kind of uh, balls deep into the Trump administration that I kind of saw the big picture for what it really was and saw that, you know, a lot of the people who were my contemporaries in that space of making anti-SJW content were really just reactionaries that were trying to roll back uh, the clock of social progress yep. and, you know, return us to some, uh, you know, idyllic 1950s um, state that, you know, not even the true 1950s, but just the leave it to beaver 1950s that only existed in television and advertising. You know, this, uh, this idea. This is so based so far. The, honestly, this is one of the things I do respect about TJ Kirk. When TJ Kirk does prepared content, he does such a good job at hitting all of the points. Like right now, in in less than five minutes, he's brought out, he's pointed out the fact that like the the, the one of the things that gets so many like incels and 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 right wingers like gets their cock so fucking hard is this is this consumerist image of the 1950s or this consumerist image of the of the pre 1950s a a a highly fantastical image and he's just nailing it right on the head this idealized version of tradition and the nuclear family and so on and so forth <laughs> Tadolf Tadolf Jitler oh no oh no fourth and, you know, I didn't really realize that I was a, a useful idiot for that. I was just trying to create entertaining content about, you know, a, a group of people that I felt were ridiculous. Amazing Aryan! No! Stop! Stop! You are all very bad! Stop it! Halt! Cease and desist! And I still feel ridiculous, but now I realize that... You know, making that sort of content is um, like 
if I were to make that video that I just talked about, if I were to say, if I were to make a whole video about how ridiculous it is that um, there are people upset at Wednesday for depicting black people as bullies, uh, not depicting all black people as bullies, but just depicting particular black people as being bullies. Um, if I were to make a video about that, it would inflame all sorts of weird racial tensions that exist out there in the world. And this is excellent. This part right here is super awesome because he's bringing on a great point, which is the fact that there are a lot, there are a lot of people who are ignorant and, and useful to the right. And it's awesome that he's been able to point this out. Um, and I would say that at this point in time, there are very few people who are genuinely ignorant anymore. Um, and I, I want to compare to someone uh, who I like to call blood on hands, AKA shoe on head. Um, shoe, on, shoe on head, blood on hands, uh, is somebody who for years has realized that if she tweets hard enough, if she makes a video hard enough about something, she has an army of, of, of dyed in the wool reactionaries who will jump on it. Do you guys remember the time when blood on hands, um, uh, uh, called a prominent, uh, black actress, a gorilla and her fans just followed sweet and literally drove that person off of, um, off of, Twitter. I remember that it was around Ghostbusters 2016 when Ghostbusters 2016 came out. Um, Leslie was Leslie Jones is her name, right? Leslie, Leslie Jones. Yeah. Leslie Jones. Um, Leslie Jones was the lead was, is an incredibly talented actress. And, um, just for being in, uh, just for being in the Ghostbusters movie, uh, shoe on head made a video where she where she uh, where she was ranting about how stupid and woke the uh, the Ghostbusters movie was and for the record I actually do think that the Ghostbusters movie was kind of painfully preachy and came across as very cringily woke I do believe that but what Shu did was Shu literally jumped so far into it that she literally called her a gorilla it was over over a Ghostbusters reboot. So just contrast the difference here. TJ finds something cringe, makes fun of it, realizes his fans are going ape shit and that right wingers are using it, and he goes, I don't want to be a part of that. Versus Blood on Hands, who realizes she can get anyone in her audience to be racist as fuck at the mo at a moment's notice, uses that ability constantly, and still to this day promotes moral panics when she wants to take somebody down. Interesting. Oh yeah, and she did that because she was defending Milo Yiannopoulos. And uh, certain people who are racist are going to use that content as a way to further their racist agenda. They're going to take what I say and they're going to extrapolate it on it and take it to some uh, horrible place that I would never take it to myself. And they're going to try to push people in that direction because they have an agenda that is um, you know, racist. This actually kind of cuts to the heart of uh, sort of this paralysis that sort of- Shu defended Milo Yiannopoulos? Shu was friends with Milo Yiannopoulos. Shu loved Milo back in the day. Hey, you want to know what's funny? You guys notice how Blood on Hands fucking constantly does pedo hunter shit, but never pedo huntered Milo Yiannopoulos, her personal friend who openly stated he was in support of pedophilia. Isn't that so strange and curious? Wow, that's very weird. Hmm, I wonder why that could be. Hold on, let's just, maybe we can just do a little quick live Google. Here's her, here's her memeing about Milo Yiannopoulos with a Gamergate channel in 2018. That one's just a little bit, that one's just a little bit funny. In a now unlisted video, 2016 video with Gregory Fleurer. Fleurer? Gregory Fuhrer? Wait, Armored Skeptic's na last name is one letter away from Fuhrer? Are you for real? Two letters? One letter?
Two letters? Two letters. Fuhrer? No. One letter and one letter position. Lapine discussed Milo Yiannopoulos' suspension from Twitter for reposting memes of the Ghostbusters star after calling uh, Leslie Jones an ape. Fuhrer then said that she looks like a man, which then shoe on head and armored skeptic agree is not racist. They just then, then they, they then added that Jones is ugly and looks like a gorilla. These are a quote, by the way. Here's the direct quote right here. Shuan had previously described Black Lives Matter as full of racists hyped by the media to start a race war. Here are some quotes. Would you say that BLM was always bullshit or did it start off legit and then was taken over by the bullshitters? Shuan Head replies, it was always bullshit in my opinion. Media hyped up white on black violence. Black people started burning down their own neighborhoods. Fucking pointless. It's just race war baiting. I can't stand it. Da this is another quote from Shoe on Head. Daily reminder that Black Lives Matter is black supremacy trash. At this point, you'd have... This is another quote from Shoe on Head. At this point, you'd have to be in serious denial to think BLM is anything other than racist supremacists and AIDS and AIDS Skrillexes filled with guilt. I don't know about the genders thing. I've come to the conclusion that if you're not hurting anybody, it's not a big deal and you can call yourself whatever the fuck you want. I feel like it's not my place to look at somebody like Riley Dennis and go, you ain't trans. Wait, actually, that's nice. Oh, I thought I, I misread this. Credit to Shu. Good job. Shu didn't jump onto Riley Dennis. Wow. Golf clap. All right, let's continue this fucking video. Why don't you pedo hunt Milo, huh? Where's the pedo hunt on Milo? Let's continue. Overtook me at a certain point, um, probably around 2016. There was a, a, a whole host of factors that led to me feeling way less comfortable with content creation, with this idea of influence and, and all these things. And uh, it all kind of comes back to the anti-SGW thing, I guess, in a way. Because when I first started making content on night, YouTube, tensions nasty. I was just uh, an angry loner with no real friends. Uh, I'd had friends in, in the past, of course, here and there, but you know, either through time or uh, distance, you know, those friendships had eroded. Uh, I don't remember any friendships ending in any particularly dramatic acrimony, but um, you know, there were. You know, all of my friendships had had eroded, and uh, you know, my family was not particularly interested in hearing what I had to say. You know, I had at that time, uh, 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 you know, a, a typical Democrat liberal mom who maybe I could say some things to, and a very conservative stepfather, and a fairly conservative uh, father, uh, an idiot stepmother. Um, I had Scotty to talk to. So he was pretty much the only person in my life that I could have any sort of real conversation with, that I could be any like version of my true self with, uh, like that I could really cut loose at all. And so uh, when the YouTube platform emerged as a medium of expression, I jumped on board right away and started just spewing whatever onto it. And, you know, people started resonating with it. And, you know, for me, it was like therapy session. For me, it was, uh, I will take the things that frustrate me about the world, about society, and I will just spew them without any filter or, or, or concern. And um, at that time, I had no co conception of, of influencing people. I had no aspiration to, of influencing people. I liked them being receptive to the things I was saying, but I I never conceived of the idea at that time. And it sounds ridiculous, but because today, this is something that's really drilled into your head. It's something that people want when they seek out this platform. They want influence. They want people to do what they say. But that really wasn't all that interesting to me at, at the time. It really still isn't. 
uh, in a lot of ways. I guess it's become more interesting to me. But at the time, the main interest I had was just venting. I, I didn't have a therapist. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any family I could talk to except for Scotty. So I just, uh, I used YouTube as a place to vent. It was easier to vent to the, the camera than it was to vent to anyone in my day-to-day -day life. And the things I said, I think, because I was uh, of a time and a place, and there was, you know, obviously, if you're an alienated youth, because I'm 21 when I started this this thing, 22 maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're an alienated youth, and there's... Yeah, I want to just hop in here real quick to say something uh, super on point to this. I started streaming in 2020. Uh, and, and, and now it's, so I was 30 when I started streaming. He was nine years younger than I was when I started streaming, when he started streaming. So not only did I have the advantage of being like, have 10 years under my belt of introspection and thinking about things in life, but also the culture around the internet started. I don't think he's lying. I don't even, I don't think he's lying at all when he says that like the culture on the internet has changed and that people are looking for influencers. They literally call us influencers. That was not the case in the early days of YouTube. There were so many people who were just putting things on YouTube just because they wanted to share whatever they were thinking about. People used YouTube way more like a, like a, like a status box on Facebook. Um, and like, and it also, if you go look at people's videos on YouTube, they were usually just people just holding a can, like a mic in front of them and going, blah, 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 blah. there was no production value in most YouTube videos. Some of them did. There were some channels that went way above and beyond, but those were considered like, those were like entertainment channels. Like for example, I think of like uh, good mythical morning, which at that time was known as Rhett and link. And they had like a, a, a they made like, but they were filmmakers. They were not just ranting or doing something personal. They were making skits and they were doing a comedy show. So there was a lot of people who just started basically sharing their various opinions, vlogging, literally, just like, this is my personal journal that I want to share with other people. So I think it's very, at least for me, I, I, I do believe uh, TJ when he says, like, I didn't know what type of impact it would have. I think a lot of people really didn't, have a concept of how far your words could reach. I think most older creators at the time saw themselves as user, as just users of a platform. Yes. Um, and that, that's how it was treated. It was, it was, it was less algorithmatized. It was, uh, there was, there wasn't like YouTube creator studio to my knowledge hadn't even existed yet. So YouTube didn't coach their, their literal employees on, on what to do. There was no formalized creator process. The back end was way different. It was way more of like a hobbyist website. Yeah, it's very awesome. interesting. Yeah, that was before copyright. So people would play whatever music they want. It's a very, very different time. Animation was a big deal. Yes, there was, yeah, that's true. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue hearing TJ out. There's other alienated youths out there in the world. And, um, you know, a lot of you are going through similar experiences, having similar interactions, feeling similarly confined by society. You know, that's going to resonate. And because oh, cool. I could express myself. Trickster Jackal says, I used to watch Mr. Atheist, then I watched Vosh, then Zan, then Dylan Burns, then you. Well, welcome. Happy to have you here. I'm glad you landed here. Uh, what an interesting path. A lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of very interesting, a lot of good names on that path. A little bit more clearly and with a little bit more passion than a lot of other people could, I sort of became a voice for a lot of people. But I didn't really recognize that was happening at the time. And if I did recognize it, I didn't really truly understand the nature of it. There was a sort of naivete to that age of YouTube. It's a naivete that really wasn't lifted from my eyes for many, many years. It wasn't really until like 2017, oh, 2018 sick, that I really started to see what was going on. 
And it was sort of the realization of, That's you know, awesome hey, there was a guy named Milo Yiannopoulos that was going to be the keynote speaker at CPAC. And he lost that because of things he said on a podcast that I hosted. He was there with me when he said those things. And, uh, you know, I brought it up because I saw it on Joe Rogan. And I'm sure, you know, even if he hadn't said it on my podcast, the Joe Rogan stuff probably still would have come to light. But the fact well, that... Wasn't that with drunken peasants, right? Is that... Isn't that... Am I misremembering? Storm Macbeth says, TJ encouraged me to push back against religious bigotry when I was first discovering my LGBT identity. And being in a small conservative town, it really helped me come into my own identity. That's awesome, Storm Macbeth. You should... Um, Storm Macbeth, at the end of this, um, at the end of this segment, we're going to do a little imp love raid. You should, you should comment that on TJ's video so that he knows that. Yeah, TJ used to co-host the Drunken Peasants. Yeah, all right, I'm, I'm, my memory does work. Yeah, my memory does work. Fuck yeah. Let's continue. At, you know, here's a person who's making national headlines that, you know, is in my sphere of influence. And, you know, you have uh, people like Carl Benjamin running for office and becoming sort of a, 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 a you know, a, a, a lightning rod over there in the UK. And, you know, his show, tremendously influential. Like, I know multiple people who have met the president of the United States. I know multiple people who have been on the most successful podcast in the country. I think in the world. I think that isn't Joe Rogan's podcast the most successful in the world? I've been on that podcast twice. You know, and and I've been on that podcast and Bernie Sanders has been on that podcast and a, a whole slew of people that are wildly influential have been on there and me. And I don't think of myself as belonging to that group of people. I don't really see myself as belonging to any group of people. I view myself as this singular sort of ego that's disconnected from the world. I view myself as an observer. So the realization that, hey, I'm not just an observer. By sharing my observations and opinions with other people, I am, whether I intend to or not, influencing things in this world. The realization really was, it hit me hard when I realized that, hey, this genre of YouTube video that I helped create is helping to elect politicians that are um, <laughs> trying to turn back the clock to, you know, Mussolini and Hitler and really uh, have contempt. Fucking straight up. Get some fucking likes for that one, TJ. It, it, at, at least he fucking says it. He's 100% correct. I'm so fucking glad he's willing to say that. Fuck yes. That's, oh, that's fucking awesome. Call it out. Call it the fuck out. For people like me, as an atheist, as a bisexual, as like an open degenerate fucking maladjusted weirdo. You know, this is not what I want. I'm standing on the edge. That's right. Queer degenerates in arms. We stand with TJ Kirk. Queer degenerates in arms. I'm not trying to create a world of of, you know, quote unquote order where a, a doofus like Donald Trump is getting his way. Donald Trump is the opposite of what I want. And yet I feel like <laughs> I don't know what my level of influence was in that whole debacle. But if I created anti-SJW content on YouTube, then I played a part in getting that stupid freaking orange imbecile elected. And that means I played a part in really fucking America up <laughs> worse than it already was. And it's like, what do I do then? Do I just say like, no, I divorce the world. I shrink away into obscurity. And I feel like for a while, that's kind of what I, I, I did. I tried to kind of be on this platform but under the radar, you know? Don't wanna get too big, don't wanna cause too much of a splash because I'm scared of that splash. I'm scared of what unintended consequences whatever splash I make might have. And it's a scary place to be 
when you're a person who views yourself as this outsider, as this observer, and you feel like you're all quarantined away in your little bubble, and you know, you're not trying to influence. You're you're never mind. Earlier I said he didn't take responsibility. I guess he did. Yeah, I was I was just about to say whoever said he doesn't take responsibility, this is about the most clear-eyed responsibility taking. This is the opposite of a YouTuber apology. This is just I realized that what I made was being used towards ends that I did not want to participate in. So I radically transformed myself so that I would no longer touch it. That is so motherfucking respectable. That is so goddamn motherfucking respectable. This video has only made my respect for TJ grow. You're just trying to vent. You're just trying to share. And if you're, if the things you share resonate with people, wow, that's great. But that's not the goal. But then you realize, hey, <laughs> this is doing more than I thought. This is having consequences that not only do I not intend, but I can't control. And um, that's horrifying. And that for a long time was a creative block for me. I remember I used to have this very irresponsible sort of idea about making content on this platform. It's an adage I had. I even shared it with the audience a few times back in the day. But the adage was this. If I can say something true or something interesting, I will say the interesting thing over the true thing because this is about entertainment. So hopefully no one's that naive anymore. Hopefully everyone... Fox Potato says, I wish Shu could have this insight. Shu had this insight and concluded in the opposite direction. Shu recognized... Oh, wow, I have influence. I'm going to use it to pedo hunt people I have a personal grudge against to assist in, in, in building a right-wing order and to constantly work against uh, anybody who so much as irritates me. Shu does know what she's doing. Marinara says, TJ's early content seems to have revealed a hole in leftist content where we were failing to properly address issues that a lot of people found relatable in an engaging way despite having better answers. Yes, but like I said, I think you're correct about that, by the way. I do think that TJ Kirk revealed that. Um, but it also revealed a larger problem, which is that there wasn't, like I said, there wasn't really much leftist content. The only real leftist analysis that you would get on the internet was at the time liberal as fuck liberal capitalist there were no socialists there were so few socialists uh or or even people willing to consider the idea of socialism so it wasn't just a uh it wasn't just a vulnerability of the left it was just i mean it was it was a vulnerability of the grand of the whole of the of the left sphere anyone left of republican all all of liberalism all of communism all of uh, anarchism had all failed at that point. And yeah, all that we had to show for it, the only pushback to fucking the Republican ghouls at that time was a handful of lefties and an army of liberals who were mostly inve invested in making money for themselves. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, Marinara says it was both liberal and dismissive of the importance of having to state the obvious. Yeah, there was basically nobody there willing to take people through the steps. But now, as you know, as fiery as I am, you guys know in my videos, I spend a lot of time, um, taking people through the steps of my logic, taking people through the steps of my reasoning, sometimes too much time, to be honest. Sometimes it honestly probably hurts my delivery because I do that. Xander Hall helped me so much. Xander helped a lot of people. One of the things that's cool about Xander Hall is that Xander Hall, uh, even if he gets even if he gets hot headed in debates, Xander Hall is not an arrogant person. Xander Hall is willing to take time to explain ideas to people without condescending to them. And I think that that I think that's one of the things I genuinely respect the most about Xander Hall. Uh, is that there's a lot of things I respect about Xander Hall. You all know this. I. I am like uh, I am like hell's strongest Xander Hall uh, supporter, and the reason for that is because I think Xander Hall, uh, despite being a bit of a hothead sometimes, um, is 
one of the most genuine people that is that is on this platform and not and on top of that he also knows how to um he knows how to engage with people who aren't familiar with new concepts in a way that is very unique i think it's one of his um uh i think it's one of his his biggest talents uh wins the podcast with xander hall xander hall just needs to move uh xan uh recently um uh, recently mentioned that he's probably going to be moving soon. We've had to put the, the podcast on hiatus because of everything that happened in his life. Um, m a lot of you might not be familiar with what happened to Xander Hall, but Xander Hall had uh, the, the nicest way to put it is a very, very messy breakup. The, the real, the truthful way to put it is that he was, he was literally stolen from to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars by his abusive ex. And it put him in a really bad position. So we haven't, we, we've had to back burner the podcast while he works out moving out of his current location. So yeah, but, uh, but he does say that he's going to, uh, he, he has said that he's going to be moving soon. Uh, did you know that Xander Hall wants to raise quail? Yes, I've talked to him about it, and I'm pretty excited about that because I would love to go hang out with his quail, and I hope that when he moves, I will be able to help him set up his quail hutch because uh, I love animals. So, yeah. Anyway, let's continue. His enthusiasm about the quail, it's it, its adorable. You all know I fucking love birds. You know I love animals. I'm a literal bird watcher. That's right. I've been telling you all about it, but I'm a bird watcher. I have a whole little book that I've been writing down all the birds I spot and everything. It's been amazing. I've been doing it for like over a year now. It's so cool. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. Realizes when they come on here and they start sharing their thoughts and opinions and beliefs. Hopefully they do it knowing it could cause a splash knowing it could cause an influence, knowing that the ripples of what they say could resonate out there in the world. I think that's actually what most people want nowadays. I don't think anyone would view this as naively and innocently as I did at the time as just like, this is a place to vent. This is a place to be my therapist. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, that was like an act of, of desperation of a disenfranchised 21-year-old uh, kid with, Another really, really great observation by TJ here. Um, I think some of us veterans of the internet take it for granted how much people really do use the internet as their journal. I have done this and I'm a professional content creator. It's so easy. The internet wants you, every, especially social media. Social media is the real place where this happens. I shouldn't even say the internet. Social media invites you to tell it everything, every personal information that it can possibly get. Fuck, social media literally invites you to tell it to tell it your location, your literal location, and it wants you to tweet pictures with your location tagged. It's absurd. Uh, social media is constantly pressuring everybody to use it like their journal. And it's no surprise that especially earlier on in the in the rise of places like YouTube that a lot of people did that. He has a real point. We spent all day, uh, we, well, I guess not today. We haven't really today. We spent many days in the past um, talking about alienation, talking about isolation. I talk about it all the time. Last stream, I went on a rant at the end of the stream, specifically talking about how technology has made us very lonely. And even though technology, the internet should bring us closer together, we should connect more powerfully. Um, it's made us more lonely. It's made us, it's made it as life goes on, we have nowhere to go, but the internet. And it is dangerous because you're, but the way that everything's structured, anything that you say on the internet could become public discourse in a day. You guys know that's happened to me many times, and I'm a public figure, and it happens to random users all the time. Uh, Bo Burnham, okay, yeah, Bo Burnham did an entire thing about this. I, I, uh, uh, it's really funny that you bring that up because Doe plays Bo Burnham on my piano over here all the time. Anyway. Yeah, it was a main target for months. Uh, it was ridiculous. Uh, everything that I said, every innocuous thing that I said, every political opinion uh, uh, I said was was scrutinized for basically a year and a half straight. It was terrible. Let's continue. You know, no uh, no sort of inkling of of how to uh, navigate the world. 
And I, I think I'm a little bit wiser now. Only a little bit, though. Not not a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I still I still feel like I have an awful lot to learn. But maybe that's a good thing because back then I felt like I had nothing to learn. I felt like I already knew it all. But that's pretty common, I think, among people of that age range. At least it was then. I don't know about 21-year-olds today. Maybe they're way more riddled with anxiety and self-doubt. I think even statistically, demonstrably, they are. I guess that for you, for a lot of people nowadays, the fear is that nothing they say matters. Nothing they say will ripple out. Well, I'm here to tell you that as someone who never wanted that and got it anyway, that it's not always all it's cracked up to be. If there's a lesson, maybe it's that. But now, I guess maybe I could talk about, uh, before we end this, maybe I could talk about where I'm at now mentally. I didn't want the power, but I got the power. I didn't know I had it when I had it. I didn't know what I was doing with it when I was doing it. And then after I did it, I, I, I kind of shrunk away from it in fear. I recoiled from it in horror. But now that I know what it is and where it is, I kind of want it again. But now that I want it, TJ becoming, is TJ going to embrace becoming a demon type streamer? Will TJ be the second demon type streamer of all time? Maybe he will. You see, being a demon type streamer in rec involves recognizing the power that you wield with your voice, the responsibility and the power therein. Perhaps TJ is going to become the second demon type streamer. That would be awesome. I encourage it. Now that I've lost the na naivete, can I still have it? Can I get it back? Can I have it back? And if I can have it back, can I use it? And if I can use it, can I control it? I don't know. <laughs> Let's find out. Oh, yeah. Based. Based! Based! Okay, wait, that was so sick. That was so sick. So I saw this thing. Okay, unironically, is it? Is it based? It is based. It is based when people realize whether or not it was their choice in attaining it. It is based when people re responsibly realize that they have a power and they want to use it for good instead of bad. Yes, that is based. Based and introspection pilled. You have power too. You might not know what it is yet. It might look different than me or TJ's power, but you do. Recognizing and building our power together is key. It's only liberals that, well, it's only liberals and fascists that want you to, uh, dis to, to throw away all of your power. Liberals and fascists want you to bow down to give them all of your power. In the case of liberals, they want you to give it to the power of the state. They want you to give it to the power of private corporations. They want you to give it to the power of the institution. That's what liberals want. And fascists want you to give your power, one way or another, to the father, to the big daddy, to the god. But us demons, our calling is to recognize our power, to recognize what powers we do have, and to, you, to our best of our ability, genuinely use them for good. And I don't just mean whatever you think is good at the moment. I mean a constant process of analyzing and, and checking yourself and saying, is, am I still doing good? Can I do better? Can I do better? So I do think that's incredibly based. Real quick, on everybody, uh, we have an opportunity right here, right now. My lovely, lovely imps, I am going to link you this video right here. Boom. Boom. I'm going to link you the video right there. Real quick, I want you to click that video, and I want you to do an imp raid. An imp raid is, when, is raiding with love. We do imp raids when we love a video, and I love that video. I think you'd love that video, and it would be beneficial to both TJ and myself if you all went in there and said, watch this with mama, love the video, fire, maybe a demon emoji, imps, let's get in there. Right now, we have 
there is 4.4K uh, likes and there is 1,263 comments. I am going to play a based ass song real quick. And by the end of the song, I want you all to have popped over to that link, pressed the like button and left a comment. Even if it's a small comment, love from the imps, watch this with mama, loved it, whatever, anything like that. I want you to go over there, tell, tell your fucking words. Let's show some love to TJ Kirk. It is extra important in these times that we strengthen our connections to other good content creators. As we spent all day talking about today, the right is going insane. We need people to network together, work together to push back against this shit.